is Pasadis, and she is uh, she was a female poet, and uh, she lived in the 20th century in Holland. And this is my translation of um, one of her poems, and uh, the the poem is titled Time. I dreamt that I was living slowly, slower than the oldest stone. It was horrible around me. Everything rushed, shook and shivered, what seemed stagnant. I saw the drift with which the trees wrenched themselves out of the earth while singing hoarse and intermittent. While the seasons blight, changing colors like rainbows, I saw the tremor of the sea, its swelling and hurried shrinking like a big throat can drink. A day and night of short time span, inyiting and extinguishing flickering fire. The despair and eloquence in the gesture of the things that are stiff otherwise and their pressing, the breathless, cruel struggle. How could I not how could I have not known before, not have seen in earlier times, and how should I ever forget this again? Okay, thank you. Thank you. We move on to the four, to be uh, part of the straight settlement in April 19. Uh, the population subsequently swelled from uh, just under 1,000 to almost uh, 5,000. And uh, this was a postcard of the day showing the natives looking at Chinatown expanding. And if you can read the caption, it actually says overcrowding in Chinatown. <laughs> 5, <000. laughs> this is there's 5,000 people. <laughs> now, this is how they arrived. This is the kind of uh, boats they arrived in. And it just looks like a very pretty harbor. Um, this is a little personal anecdote. My mom herself came by boat as well. And I have to say that it was such a traumatic experience that she never wanted to get on another boat again in her life. Ever. So she wouldn't even take a ferry to Sentosa. Never again. So this gives you an idea of the kind of uh, difficult journeys it would be. So my grandfather, for example, came a couple of times and only when he settled here, he was a coolie. And later on he became a bookshop owner and only when he succeeded did he bring his family over. So he would have made a couple of trips whereas I think that trip for my grandmother and the children would be very difficult. Uh, and of course my mother herself had a different journey. Now later on, you see that uh, all the colonial buildings were beginning to be built and becoming a very busy uh, colonial administrative centre. And this would be how busy it was in Bootkey in its day, when there's chock a block of boats. So in those days, the name of uh, Singapore is Asingjo, and it means the Isle of Stars. And this gives you an indication of both the maritime journey from China and also the world at that time which was pretty much governed by maritime powers. Here we were part of the British uh, Empire and of course uh, Indonesia was the Dutch East Indies, very much a mercantile trade. So a lot of the pioneers that we are going to visit, you know, they basically made their, their money through those days through the uh, maritime trade. And typically what would happen is that you get to Boki they will disembark after a long journey, they will go straight to the clan temples. So even today, if you go along Philip Street, there is the Wahapo, which is a Teochew temple, and then further down is Hong San Si, the Hokkien temple on Tala Ai, and they'll go there and give thanks to Masu, the goddess of the sea, and subsequently go up to Top Street and try and find a job by signing up. So I just want to give you some colour as to uh, what it was in those days. So this is how um, Te Ko Yat would have arrived from China. He came as a labourer at age 16 and uh, he lived with uh, his employer on Boat Key uh, upstairs. He earned $2 a day but because he had both a uh, board and a food, um, he was able to send $1.50 back to his family in China and he lived on the 50 cents a day. Just to give you a sense of how much that would be, uh, each cent is 4 copper coins and 1 copper coin can buy you a meal. He saved enough money over 10 years that at age 26, he began to trade as well. And he traded in salted fish, okay? Mm -hmm. Get you as a Hawkins, no, we love our right? So he traded in salted fish. 
the Indonesia connection is quite important uh, as to why we are standing here today to talk about this. Uh, he's quite an accomplished person, um, subsequently owned a bus company, but I'm going to talk more about his war contributions. Uh, one of the things that Dei Koyat did was to form um, the Singapore Volunteer Forces. And uh, in those days, uh, he was able to cobble together 20,000 men. Now what they did basically was to keep uh, civil order. So for example, uh, you know, order on the streets, to prevent gangsterism, petty thefts, um, putting out fires, for example. And uh, they were very much focused on support raising funds for the Sino-Japanese War, which is being fought in the homeland. As a result, when Singapore fell to the Japanese, eventually, February 15, 1942, Teikoya was number two on the most wanted list. Number one is Wong Chung Yuk from the police forces. He's buried in the other hill, Hill 4. Both of them fled to Indonesia. So this is where his Indonesia connections is very important. He was harbored safely. Wong Chung Yuk, unfortunately, was betrayed and murdered. He was subsequently uh, reburied, exhumed and reburied here 12 years later and came back home to a start of honor. Teikoya himself survived the war. And during the war, uh, the Japanese had conducted the massacre known as Sokcheng. The Sokcheng massacre took about, the historical estimate is between 50 and 100,000 Chinese up and down the peninsula. And uh, when the Japanese generals were tried in the War Crimes Tribunal, he was one of six people invited to the hearing. And this was in part because he was a community leader and he had fought for compensation for his men's uh, widow and children. At first, the British did not want to give compensation, but he succeeded in fighting for that compensation. And when he was asked to give testimony, he actually said to the two generals, even though your souls will descend to hell, you will not be enough to compensate for your sins. Sui Kuei died Chinese New Year's Eve in 1957. His family, and we have spoken to the descendants, his family did not think that a lot of people would turn up for the wake because the three days of the wake were the first three days of Chinese New Year that year. So they were completely overwhelmed because 10,000 people turned up for the funeral. And the cottage was 100 buses that came from uh, Tela Aie. So they walked the cottage up to Fullerton and then the bus came to the ground. Um, so, although a lot of the older Singaporeans do remember Tei Koyat from the Tei Koyat bus company that he formed, um, the older ones who went to the war will actually remember uh, Tei Koyat as a war patriot. So as you know, just uh, two weekends ago, um, was the anniversary of the first bombs dropping in Singapore. Dropped on December the 8th, and by February would have fallen. Now among those who fell, in this war were also the Suffolk's in Cambridgeshire. They were lads from the British army. They had actually been expected to fight in, in Egypt according to battlefield historian John Cooper. So can you imagine you're training for the desert warfare and instead ended up here in the tropics um, and facing an unknown enemy, the Japanese, you know, with their swords and their tanks. So it was uh, quite, quite an energetic battle. The battle was on the other side, Adam Park. So John is doing the Adam Park project, so I encourage you guys to uh, add it on the Facebook page and follow his uh, progress. Because what he has actually done is started digging in the houses along Adam Road to find the artifacts. And they have actually found some interesting things. So what John basically does is he does battlefield archaeology. And one of the things that is very notable about Bukit Brown, when he actually studied the battle, was that this is the Japanese map and this is the British map. And when you compare it to what it is today, he said this is one of the very, very few battlefield sites that are intact more than seven decades later. Whether it's in Europe, uh, or in Japan, all the theaters of war, the landscape actually changed a lot. So what has happened is all these markings are very helpful in trying to find the nine missing boys who died in battle here. They lost. What the Japanese were trying to do was they were trying to fight the long Adam Road, go across and cut off the water supply at Thompson Waterworks. They knew that if they cut off the water supply to the city, Singapore would fall. The Japanese were desperate. They had only three days of ammunition left. So they had to win this battle. The British did not know this. And when Singapore fell, 
is you know, three days away you know, from holding the fort. So basically, you came down along Chiang Pok Road. If you go further down, you see Command House. That's where Percival was, right, um, to command uh, the battle. So they basically fought, and there are nine missing soldiers. We're still trying to find the last missing soldier. So John Cooper has written a very moving uh, blog post about the missing uh, soldiers. And the, the British among us know uh, the phrase that there's a little piece of England wherever a British lad has fallen. Just as a point of interest, about two, three weeks ago, um, also, a pastor that was serving the boys actually has records that shows that five Indian soldiers were massacred in the Kiang Pok village. So uh, the documentation team has started digging because they are listed in Kanji as missing in action. So their bodies are still not found. And according to the eyewitness account of the pastor, we showed this community. Hopefully we can find soldiers for them. So seeing as that we have now begun in the period of the war, the war poem, in honor of the war dead. This one is by... What passing bells for those who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns, only the stuffing rifles' rapid rattle can peter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries for them from prayers or bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells, and bugles calling for them from sad trials. What candles can be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes, shall shine the holy glimmers of the vice. The pallor of those brows shall be their fall, their flowers, the tenderness of patient minds, and each slow dust, a drawing down of line. So, so um, when we were writing to the government in, in appealing to save Bukit Brown, one of the things that we have highlighted is the fact that uh, Bukit Brown is a battle site and we should be honoured for that. Mm -hmm. We are still also trying to find the mass graves uh, for the civilians. The records show that uh, burial stopped for about three weeks. So after Singapore fell, the Japanese, there was chaos. But of course, a lot of dead in the streets, both from the bombing as well as the massacres and other things. And then the records resumed. And in the records, it's shown SMC trucks, which stands for Singapore Municipal Cemetery trucks. And it records thousands were trucks here. It would be what we call the cut and bury. So you cut the earth, you bury them by the truck loads, you put lime, and you bury them until it's all full. So we're still trying to find where the mass graves are. According to oral history by the tomb keepers, uh, they themselves have witnessed what they call the dirty spots, but they're not allowed to play when they were children. So they said, don't play there, that, that's dirty because they died unjustly. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, uh, if we can save Bukit Brown as a battle site, then at least we still have time to find both the civilian dead as well as the soldiers who died. Okay, two story and, um, and also um, a war poem, but from a different era. This is by a, a Tang poet uh, called Du Fu. And um, uh, the Tang dynasty was in the around 7th century. Um, this poem is called Thinking of My Brothers on a Moonlit Night. The army drums cut off human travel. A lone goose sounds on the borderland in autumn. Tonight we start the season of white dew. The moon is just as bright as in my homeland. My brothers are spread all throughout the land. No home to ask if they are living or dead. The letters we send always go astray, and still the fighting does not cease. Uh, what, what people call Peranakan tiles. Yeah. And just so you know that it's a misnomer, basically what happened was when Singapore and Malaysia was under the British, and Indonesia then was under the Dutch. Both the British and the Dutch used tiles, in the kitchens and fireplaces because it's easier to clean the suit, right? Yeah. So the British uh, adapt, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, the Chinese adapted this style, but
but thankfully a bit more gregarious they didn't limit it to the stove and the fireplace they use it all over the place in the inner courtyard outer courtyard five foot away everywhere and even took them to their graves we are very, very grateful that they were able to display their love for this art form it is an art form it's died out already um, because the color uses a metallic glaze and they're very lasting as you can see uh, this person died a long time ago and still the colors are vibrant these ones by the way happen to be Japanese tiles what happened was uh, there's such demand in the end that uh, the Europeans could not keep up with the demand the Japanese then stepped in and for better or for worse the British then allowed the technology to pass to the Japanese who managed to do everything cheaper better faster <laughs> and met the demand they were also very smart because their designs were more attuned to Asian culture, both in terms of uh, shapes, colors, and the flowers. So the flowers are more adapted to the flowers that uh, have meaning for the Chinese. So we're going to walk out about 20 meters and I'll show you a Belgian one. Yeah. So these ones, as you can see, are very European in design. Uh, Art Nouveau, as they call it. And I think it looks like those... Uh, like flower wreaths that you might hang in your home or over the fireplace. Mm -hmm. The colours are a bit more, the tiles, the background are usually a bit more translucent. Um, but nonetheless, the blues, for example, are very vibrant. So they are triple glazed. So even though the tiles actually have cracked from behind, for whatever reason, the tile itself will not crack because it's beautifully glazed over. So in situations like this, all you need is some arm power <laughs> and water and you just pop up really beautiful. So hopefully we can preserve Bukit Brown so you guys can see a lot of these. Uh, unfortunately on Hill 1, there are a lot of beautiful child graves that will be gone. So, a pity. Can I... Wondering about all the flowers, is a descendant of Tan Kiam Hock who is mm. coming up here. Mm. Thanks to them clearing the whole cluster, that's Mrs. Tan Kiam Hock, who I feel is standing. Mm. Yeah. So that's the wife of the municipal commissioner who is responsible for making Bukit Brown a reality. Mm. Yeah. But they also kindly decided to look after Dolly. So whatever sad life Dolly has led, I think she has yeah. had many friends in life and in death. Why do you call her Dolly? That is her. Japanese, and at the bottom, it's in English at the bottom. Oh, okay. Dolly. Yeah, it's Dolly. So it's an interesting uh, tomb inscription. We have Japanese, Mandarin and English. So this again reinforces the uniqueness of Bukit Brown and, and the kind of inscriptions that we find here. Okay. Has the photo been removed? No, probably never had a chance to put it. It is what we call the 1830s cluster. They would have uh, been born in the late 1700s and died in the 1830s, making them the earliest immigrants after Sir Sanford Raffles declared this place to be part of the Great Settlement. 
So these are our earliest pioneers, essentially. And uh, the Tomb Whisperer, Raymond Goh, in fact, when he was very interested in looking at all these names, so do come forward, you can see all the different emperor's names. There is Tong Zi, there is Gao Huang. That's the different emperor's names. And he actually stumbled upon Some of them are, that yeah. half is not affected. Then what happened was, when they were actually clearing the undergrowth to exhume these graves, they discovered there were more there that we never knew about. So unfortunately, though they have been together in death from Tiong Bahru to Bukit Brown, they are about to be separated. So, I am going to read a poem that I wrote when I learned about their fate. So I encourage you to just walk around and contemplate while I read this poem. I called it the Sentinels of Bukit Brown. We stand, the Sentinels of Bukit Brown. Watch this land we call Sing Zhou from afar. Put down roots, rebuild our lives. Cajoled our families to join us. We, the Sing Kate, arrive. Farewells are plenty in our lifetimes. To family, to China. Here in our new home, to our former burial grounds, which looked after us as we made our way for our descendants and for more thinking. Goodbye, Tiong Baru. Hello, Bukit Brown. Years have passed like a gentle breath, like the wind. Bombs came, new inventions we did not yet know, shouts of languages we did not fully understand. In death, others whispered to us that which we did not witness. The Japanese came with shouts of banzai, and the British scrambling in the undergrowth to hide amongst us. Then, peace and quiet again. Roots grew around us, sheltered us, and we hosted the birds and monkeys and spied an occasional dog. We hid a few snakes in our time. We enjoyed the distant voices of children at play. We, the sentinels of Bukit Brown. And now, time for more farewell. Our friends and neighbours in death, long have we stood together. Decades have come and gone, and among many farewells, we never expected the dead would be parted. Not like this. Ong, I see you over there. Chiu, you look bright and clean with the grass trim. Lim, I never knew yet so many children. So many years, and now, not enough time. We don't have time left to get to know each other better. We thought we had eternity. We thought we were the sentinels of Bukit Brown, and all we had was time. <laughs> Come, let us not tarry. Let's get to know each other better before our final farewell. We who know how to depart and how to find new homes. Come. Hokkien tombs and the ones above in grey are Teochew tombs. So if we had been able to save this hill, this would have been a living museum where within like 20 meters you can look at two kinds of clusters. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, if you turn around, this goes down the valley. Now Nature Society has actually done a study and they said this valley is actually the luscious part mm -hmm. of Bukit Brown because it's not as easy for us to uh, get down as you can see. And therefore, it, uh, it's a biodiverse yeah. area mm. and hosts yeah. many of the birds and plant species down mm. here. We'll have a better view of it on the other side. Bing is a nature expert, so he will be able to tell you a bit more. Mm. But we're very, very sad to lose this valley. Mm. 
and by building the overpass, what will happen is that the sunlight cannot reach, mm. so maybe a lot of the places below will actually dry up mm. and cause erosion that will go into the stream. The, what we call the paupers. So those were the, the yeah, poor people. Yeah. And um, basically, the normal people. Yeah, well, like, well, I mean, well. if we would have lived in those days, probably we would be the one you know, buried there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so this area is usually taken care of by the, by the uh, temples. And um, they take care of all the graves here and make sure they are clean up. Yeah, and normally what happens is either they are too poor, obviously, to have a plot, or they are too poor to get married and have children who will then bury them. So the community buries them, yeah? So I'm going to, going to read three poems here. Um, the first one is from uh, a, a, a poet called Levi. He's uh, also a, a Tang Dynasty poet, so from the 7th century, and very famous in China. Um, this poem is called Thoughts on a Still Night. The bright moon shone before my bed. I wondered, was it frost upon the ground? I raised my head to gaze at the clear moon, bowed my head, remembering my old home. Okay, the next uh, poem is by um, uh, Singapore's uh, very own poet, Pushok Wan, whose grave we will be visiting later, but I'm going to read two of his poems here because there's more space here to stand around. And uh, this poem is titled Marriage at the Equator. I sit beneath a palm, a stranger to the tropics, watching the raucous crowd gathered around a bonfire. A veiled woman there dances under the moonlight, like a dark spirit on a, on a starry night. She makes a way toward me. I sip coconut milk. It's tank that like of goat cheese, and the taste and taste the clams roasted with beetle nuts. The bulocat lumbers, simple in its brilliance. The song parts the wildflowers that open beside its path. Okay, the next one is called Missing Home in the Monsoon Rains. Okay, I hope you're not experiencing that. I hope I'm going to cool down the rain. <laughs> On this sweltering tropical island, winds after a rain feel like a winter gust. Local children point at me, a stranger from the north, the bringer of chill winds, that jibes remind me that from here I cannot see the plum blossoms of home. In my leisure hours, I will part the clouds with the music of my flute. Okay, we'll move on now. They're using the program to study time and doing like all the recording points. So they 
inspired by what? Uh, this is a natural stream, and unfortunately, this is also affected by the by the highway. Okay, um, so I'm going to read um, uh, one, two, three poems here um, that are kind of um, about environment, about the nature, about the, the weather, and, and all this. <coughs> And the first one is a poem by Kushok Wan and he wrote this poem uh, in the eighth month upon hearing of the coup in Beijing. Uh, this was during the, the time that, um, of the, the, the revolution and he was kind of supporting um, the, um, yeah, the, the traditional uh, emperor. <coughs> this poem is called Tempest. A tempest rattles the window, the beating of flags against the wall, an echo of guns. After the wind leave, wind leaves and branches lie, fallen, as the storm clouds depart, for other locales. In slants of afternoon sunlight, dust spirals in the wind, a swirling dragon, and in its flight, an answer, separated from its mate. Where are all our heroes? It falls to you and me. Okay, the next poem is uh, again by Dufu. So that's from the Tang Dynasty. It's called Traveling Again. I remember the temple, this route I've traveled before. I recall the bridge as I cross it again. It seems the hills and the rivers have been waiting. The flowers and the willows are selfless now. The field is sleek and vivid. Thin mist shines. On soft sand, the sunlight's color shows its late. All the traveler's sorrow fades away. What better place to rest than this? The next uh, poem is by Chow Chow. It's called Walking from Shaman and Looking at the Blue Sea. East of Jesha Mountain, I gaze at the blue sea. The water dances so gently. The mountain island towers. Trees here grow thick and hundred grasses are lush. The autumn wind sows. Great waves rise up. The path of the sun and moon seems to come from within. The splendid Milky Way seems to come from inside. Oh, I'm so lucky to be singing my song. Okay, now uh, we'll be taking a walk up to Kushok One's grave. Uh, it's a bit of a uh, climb up the hill. And there's not a lot of space to stand around. That's why I've been reading some of his poems uh, just now and here. And, um, but the ones pertaining to um, his grave and his, his departing, um, I'll be reading at the grave itself. Silk one. Do the chocolate? Yeah, yeah. 
There's an exhibition so about him. He was invited to write some of the eulogies, oh. some of the prominent pioneers here in the ground. Okay. And um, okay, we have Andrew here with us, uh, and he will be uh, he will be later reading the Chinese version of the poems that I'm reading in English first. Um, so Kushok uh, One um, uh, has written uh, his own. Uh, he has, has built his own grave and he has written reflections on building his grave. So this poem is called Reflections on Building My Grave. In sea and on hills, little space even for my abode. How then may these buried bones leap over the sword front? Uh, even were you to fall a third time, I still have no hope of rising from uh, Xinzhou's so soil, when I fall, at last, into repose. A petal brushes my headstone, another butterfly repeats life's circle. Yet even in these grave markers, styles alter with time, like grass growing anew in its season, with each passing year, changes again touch our southern home. Okay. What she has read to you? He basically did it himself. At the end of it, you can see his Prata Lauren. So, what does it mean? You might want to have a hassle, I guess. No. I have another guess. That's the obvious one, right? Is it Baba? No. Two tries already. Anyone can do maths? It is. Yes, 64. So what he's saying is that he basically came out of this book tree when he was 64. And he's sitting here. I only got a couple of copies. share this around and you can see that he's actually sitting here at this very oh. spot I have another copy you can take a look at it <laughs> there's actually an exhibition on Kishok 1 at the National Library on uh, level 6 and 7 I believe uh, yes. or 5 and 6 what page is until that on? 22 yeah. until February 22. next year mm -hmm. and uh, so you can okay. you, you can uh, you know go there and visit yourself and read more about him and, and about his life and um, see some of the, the things which the family members have shared mm -hmm. in, um, for the exhibition one of the main things is that Kusyok One was a fervent supporter of education reform and therefore have an education for women so he uh, uh, funded the SCGS Singapore Chinese Girls School. Okay. Oh.
Okay, uh, for some of you who actually has uh, the book, right, you can share around the book. It's on page 32. You see that Kusyoma is sitting here, right at this spot. Sitting, actually he's sitting. You can look at your foot. Yeah. And next to uh, him is actually his daughter and his son-in-law. At this point. So, Basically, he built this grave right before he passed off. I think uh, about a few years before that. The name of his house was not so, it was supposed to be so great. And uh, what you can see uh, really out in Chinese is Ti Bing Chou and Sun Kuang. Sun Kuang means that it's a life grave. It means that you construct the grave before you pass on. So that is what it means. Okay, what. Uh, the uncle I read to you is actually in English. I'll do the Chinese uh, version. Actually, this is the original version. There's no English version actually. Hai san wu di zu, xian rong, mai gu yu nen huo jian tan, san xia san zhen zhong bu qi, xin zhu yi huo ren chang gan, bei hua kuang wu qian shen die, huo he si ting, so you read the English version right is that sort of give you the what he was trying to say in Chinese. I mean that Chinese are a bit uh chima. It's all classical Chinese is even for us right it's quite hard to understand. So what he's trying to say is that basically, uh, I'll read the English version to you again. In seas and mm. on hills, little space even for my abode. How then may this buried bone sleep over the sword pond? Even you who call a third time, I will have no hope arising from Singapore's sword. Now you look at this Xingzhou, uh, this particular, this two words here. There's a significance here because he was the person actually to popularize this term Xingzhou. Xingzhou in other words means Singapore. Okay? For some of us or the older folks that we may have seen, uh, there is this new paper, newspaper called Xingzhou mm -hmm. Rebao. Xingzhou Rebao. Before it became a Lian He Zhao Bao. If you are Malaysian, this newspaper continues in Malaysia. Xingzhou Rebao. So he is the guy who coined this phrase or popularized it because actually the previous person actually also came up with this term but he actually made this term very popular because he himself is a journalist. He started newspapers and he was the editor of many of the plans and associations and as secretary. So basically he was a very learned man. But why is he a very learned man? Because by the fact that he was a Jiren. He was uh, Singapore's Zui Ho Dei Wei Jiren. Uh, what is a Jiren? Jiren is, uh, let me explain the imperial exam system. How it goes is that usually at your village you will have an exam. And after that you move on to cities and finally Shang Jing Kao Si. Means you go for the final imperial exam. So at his uh, county level, he got the term as Jiren because it means that he had top, top students from that particular county. But what happened was that eventually when he go for the Sang Jing, the final examination, fortunately he didn't make it. Uh. <laughs> so he got a bit disappointed about the system. You see, in the old days in China, right, in order to be someone great, one of the ways to do it uh, is to be a scholar, to pass all the examinations. So he didn't make it, so he went back to his other life which was pretty good because his father was one of the most uh, wealthy uh, persons here in Singapore, in Singapore at the time because he was a rice merchant yeah. I think he traded in Vietnam and he made a big pile of money so when his father died right at that time right he was supposed to have one million dollars in his estate in, in those days that you have one million dollars that's a huge sum of money. So he's a person of means of that thing. So he, he stopped doing uh, his exams. 
after that he came back to Singapore and continued with his very privileged life. You know, is that? So our privileged life. <laughs> <laughs> so he came back um, and he was a very active uh, person that actually uh, promoted arts and health and education. As you can see, he donated a great sum of money. In fact, half of the cost of SCGS, the school around the corner here, which caused all the traffic jams every morning, <laughs> uh, is actually uh, started by him and uh, two other guys, which is uh, Boon King and so on. And so, on. so he was very generous with his money and he gave to many worthy cause. One of, of course, his favorite, of course, is being a revolutionary. Uh, he was one of them because he supported this guy called Kang Yu Wei. Uh, you understand during the Chinese, uh, the, towards the end of the Manchu uh, dynasty, we have this very uh, famous personality called Empress Dowager, right? So uh, Empress Dowager was lord over Guangxi Wang. Guangxi Wang was the second last emperor. The last emperor was actually the, his, his nephew. So Guangxi was uh, in power for I think 30 years, so not in power, on the throne for 30 over years, but all this time, Empress Dowager was at the back behind the wheel. So she was actually the de facto ruler of the Manchu uh, dynasty. So how Kuang Shui got onto the throne again was because the previous one died and he was chosen because why? He was actually a child when he became an emperor. In that sense, he was chosen because in that sense, it's easier to control. So as he grew up to be a man, he got to think that otherwise, why should I be under the control of this old lady, right? So he had a group of so-called scholars who were actually thinking of reform. So what is a reform is, and one of these person here is called Kang Yu Wei. So Kang Yu Wei actually started uh, petitioning uh, to the emperor. Because at that time, uh, so you will have a bit of history again. China was under attack by a lot of foreign powers. One of them was the Jap uh, Japan. So they lost the war, which is called Jiao Wu Zhan Jiang Zhan Zhen. After that, right, Taiwan was ceded to uh, Japan and another territory was lost. And because of this, right, Kang Yu Wei uh, wrote many theses to the emperor and he got into the emperor's favor and, he, and his associates started this viral uh, racing. This basically reformist movement. This reformist movement failed and Kang Yu Wei was on the run. So one of his favorite supporters was of course our friend here, Mr. Ku Xiaohan, who very uh, willingly take him under his arm. So where did Kang Yu Wei stay? He actually stayed in Boat Ti, you know, where you see our Singapore River, you see the river cruise, right? You see this tall building called OUB uh, Wine. That is the location of the shop house whereby Kang Yu Wei actually stayed. So he was a very wealthy wise merchant, the son of a wise merchant. And he supported the reformists. So large sums of money were donated to Kang Yu Wei's movement overseas to US and other various areas. Because Kang Yu Wei went to US you know, in those days. So he's, all these guys are actually very well treasured. But at the end of the day, we know that history says is the reform. This Bao Wang I mean this group of guys they're actually supporting uh, Emperor Kong Sui uh, but this they failed and eventually another person rose to prominence that person is Sun Yat Sun and Sun Yat Sun supporters are all far far in this cemetery <laughs> that will be a day of another tour uh, but he is a supporter of Kong Sui Wang but after that as you can see because the 100 days uh, revolution sort of failed and the Empress Dowager regained control of the whole situation and Kuang Shui Wang was placed under house arrest basically and as you know uh, some of he eventually died just one day before the first time so there was rumours again are not confirmed but you read the historical books yeah. they say that Empress Dowager actually poisoned him before she passed out <laughs> and then you see the last emperor coming in, which is Emperor Fu Yi, which is Xuan Pong. You look at the names of some of these groups. So that is the historical setting that uh, he was in. So it's a time of uh, tremendous turmoil and upheaval in China. Where you have different uh, movements, political movements moving. 
one of them of course uh, which is which one is related to and later on you can see uh, uh, the revolutionaries which you see uh, people like Ban Chuan Nam who will pass by so those guys right were actually in the thick of things uh, in China because they were supporting uh, the revolutions with their money from here and there. So he, like I said, right, was very generous with his money. Lots of money to all the revolutionaries. Lots of money to the school. So by the time he was 34, he was made a man. Okay. Uh, he was not very good with his money. <laughs> like, that way. But speaking of the revolutionaries, if you go to the Sun Yat-sen Memorial Hall, there's currently an exhibition on the six men yes. who saved Wang Qingyuan. So those six men, they have a big role in all this yes. uh, action that uh, Andrew has just spoken about. And uh, they've done a very good job curating the artifacts. And so I would highly encourage you to go there and have a look. So, uh, back to him again. So, <laughs> poor thing, uh, he, he gave a lot of his money and fed most of his wealth to all the causes. To, to actually to his own detriment so his his uh, family wealth he actually inherited the bulk of uh, his father's inheritance because he's supposed to be the smartest kid right because he has uh, the children title but uh, studying uh, and doing financial management is different so he's not really a good businessman so uh, eventually he became bankrupt but he's still very good with his pen right like i said he started newspaper he's an editor and he is what you call Nan Chao Si Zhong. We regarded him as Nan Chao Si Zhong. What does it mean, this term? Nan Chao means that you are a migrant, uh, someone who is staying in Nanyang, this area. Si Zhong, of course, is a grand poet or master poet. Why is that so? Because in those days, uh, I don't think there are many children around, <laughs> not many scholars around. And he is a very prolific as a, as a poet. poet. He came out, I think, uh, I think thousand old pieces of uh, basically poetry, and a lot of them uh, depicts uh, uh, life in Nanyang, which is this area. So, go for this exhibition is still on, and you can see uh, the actual artifacts and Kang uh, Wei's uh, letters to Wu Xiao Wan. You can see it at the exhibition, and you can actually hear poetry read to you in Chinese and in Hokkien because he is Hokkien but now you are one of the very small group of people who actually have seen his book because most guys right, just go to a nice air condition <laughs> exhibit right uh, but, that but also like. don't forget to mention that when his yeah. wife passed away I haven't got to that yet uh, the next one I haven't got to that yet <laughs> uh, <laughs> we are talking about his grave just look at this, this word here. It's special, you know, it has a special meaning. It's uh, looks like Ji Si, but it's not Ji Si. What? Chu Si. Is this someone uh, that is Li Kai the Quan Chang, left the uh, strife of the political world? So it means he is like a recluse in a, in a sense. Because towards the end of his life, he was very much uh, into Buddhism. So he was also one of the founding members of the Singapore Buddhist Lodge. Uh, so many of these activities, uh, you can see his life uh, is really a personal, you know, roller coaster kind of life. Uh, he has it all here. So if you want, anyone want to make a movie about him, right, uh, it's great. Uh. But you look at his photo, uh, he's not so great looking. But uh, we always can find some handsome more actors. <laughs> so let Bianca read the poem. Yes. <laughs> okay. So this this poem he read, uh, he wrote when he uh, when he, his wife had passed on, and um, he was basically um, bankrupt. He didn't have money to get her proper grave. Um, so he actually um, uh, extracted a flute from his mouth and buried it together with his wife and promised her that okay once i have the money i will give you a proper, uh, proper burial so and this, this poem is here would do that. Talking, <laughs> talking about that <laughs> so the poem is titled <laughs> my wife's passing we go to the grave but not together so i send this tooth with you 
accompanied by autumnal chants of the ghosts singing at your grave. Now I have pulled the roots out, of, out from my own mouth, recalling our days, discussing Nangkwa. My tooth is all I have left for your comfort. Okay, maybe I'll read the Chinese version of the rule. Hu Xu Mai Gu Dan Mai Ya Xu Yi Qing Wu Wen Tang Bao Jia Zan Tu Gui Gen Wu Ke Yi Jie Chan Wei Yi Suo Man Hua. Yeah, all these themes are actually uh, is quite cheap uh, because uh, it has a lot of Buddhist uh, philosophy in it. Because of the sky, because of time, I highly recommend you to go for this exhibition. If anyone want to have a coffee, take this one. Uh, you can get yes. your own coffee at the library. At the exhibition. <laughs> I'm passing this coffee so that uh, to get people to go for the exhibition. Where, where is it's, the exhibition? It's on, in the National Library. One of the upper floors. It will end on February. 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 So you yes. still have time, yeah? You still have time. Yes, the yes. Central can Library can is on the 7th and 8th floor. floor. Okay, before we, before we move on, um, I would like to read uh, this poem that he, he read uh, three days before his death uh, as, a, as a farewell. And um, so we can all say farewell to him because his grave is going to go. So the poem is titled, Upon Waking from a Dream of Saying Farewell. Sending a friend on his way journeying many miles to return home, wishing him space enough to make for himself a name. Once the boat overflows, with good wishes in unison raised, the ship sets out, sailing for the old lands of home. Yes. Yeah. Some are very proud even yeah. of, you know, having built it and they take many photos of them sitting on their own grave, you know, before they pass on. In the, in the Chinese culture, it's important to live well, but even more important to die well, because your name carries on, mm. so your reputation carries on. So if you die well, you build a nice grave, that means a good feng shui will pass on to your future generations. Until so the road gets why. built over you. <laughs> <laughs> and there are even graves here uh, that are built, but there's actually... Um, you know, maybe a, a, a double tomb for a husband and a wife, and only one of them is actually buried there. So you'll see the, the date of death only on one side and not on the other side, for the other person. Maybe they, they passed on after the cemetery stopped taking in burials, which was in 1973. Or for some other reason, maybe uh, they buried, maybe they remarried and, you know, got buried with the, the next husband or wife. Or, by the sea, and with vessels and boats large and small anchored around it. The glitter of artificial lights at night are like a crown of illuminated stars when viewed from afar. Chou, the word island, and the word Chou, boat, are homonyms. While the boat lights are like stars, those of the island are like the Big Dipper to accentuate as constellation. This is why the word Sinjo was widely known by folks here and afar. So as I mentioned, we started talking about the Stanford Raffles, you know, um, setting out this place. And then soon all the uh, immigrants uh, came south. The whole idea of coming south is very important. So the whole Nanyang culture comes from the, the southern Chinese, but also Quite apt since we are talking about a cemetery. When you face south or when you go south, it means you are going to your death. Okay, so I will read a poem by the Singapore poet Wu Kim Ching, who was my classmate, who is himself an immigrant, has now immigrated to Australia. And I read farewell, the eternal farewell of the Chinese poets, the last look on all things looked at. Departure. Tomorrow you will take the road south and I will head north. It will not be long before we ask why we leave. I will send the postcards back to this abode of everlasting peace. Okay. 
unfortunately his peace is about to be disturbed. So I suggest we end the tour here with a minute of silence. So I'll wait for it for that one. I encourage you to go for the exhibition and find out more about this great man. Where is the exhibition? National Museum? National, National Library. Library. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Oh, that's okay. We took some.